All right. So uh, the topic in particular we decided to move forward with is to talk is to talk about checkpoints. Um, one of our um, most popular open source projects. This is something that uh, that we're quite passionate about, and I thought rather than talking about another one of our commercial solutions, we thought let's talk about uh, open source projects and what we're doing with the community today. And in particular, we're talking about Open AppSec. We have a handful of other projects, but I wanted to talk about Open AppSec today. And the purpose of Open AppSec, and you heard the topic again, it's about uh, securing web and uh, API endpoints, web and API endpoints, with with a new approach, with a new approach um, of replication and API protection. Let me start by giving you a brief on what the, pro uh, what the project is about. Before that, uh, a little bit of orientation. Here's the agenda of how we go about it. I'll give you a brief on the project. We will premise, and then I will like give you a post preamble of um, why this project came about the issues that we try to address uh, by by uh, by having this project open source and then we'll talk about how this project does what it does we'll talk about the fact that it's a signatureless kind of work where i then have a few examples of how it was actually uh, used in the field a couple of zero day attacks that it did prevent live uh, which is quite interesting we do have a few blogs written about it from our from us and from uh, a few uh, third-party agencies as well and then a quick demo and we'll then break for the takeaways so about the project the premise of the project is uh, it started off with the fact that we were you know it was in the mid 2017 mid 20s 2017 2018 is when uh, you know the founders of, of the project then who were not uh, still with Checkpoint, who were a startup at that point of time, kind of uh, contemplated on how application security, particularly from a run point of view, from a prevention point of view at run, um, was not catching up. Conventional, most of the approaches that they, that they used were quite conventional. It was mostly based on static rules, um, and they saw a lot of overhead in implementing conventional application security solutions. It took three months, four months, we all know the grind to have a bath up and running, right? And they saw that today's applications are quite different. They're, they, they're made of smaller chunks. Uh, they, they have a radically different way of getting rolled out into production. They, uh, they, they, they're quite more agile compared to their predecessors. So AppSec as well needed to evolve. It needed to raise to address uh, the new nature of web applications. And this is where they started to um, move towards a more, let's let's let the machines deal with it approach. And they built an ML-based back. Now, about the project itself, which then later got open sourced. We open sourced this about, uh, let's say almost a year and a half ago now. Uh, we It's again, it's called OpenAppSec. And the pure and simple, function of it is to protect web application and API endpoints with uh, with a signatureless approach. It's all machine learning under the hood. And we'll look at this in various different shapes and forms. The uh, the accolades that is received during uh, during its time in the field is that it prevented three uh, zero day attacks. Two of them were simulated by our folks with no, with no uh, previous uh, definitions put in place. But uh, one of them, Log4j in particular, was caught in the field. It was caught in the wild. So it's quite quite interesting how uh, how we were able to prevent it. I'll have one of those. I'll give you a rundown of how we prevented Log4j in particular. And the main differentiator is that this particular WAF, we kind of moved away from how the other WAFs were uh, moving their deployment models most of the WAFs that you see in the industry today is WAF as a service, right? You consume it, consume it as a service, you uh, change your DNS records, you redirect your traffic to the point of presence of the WAF vendor, and then you get the redirected traffic back to you. This was not the most ideal way we saw uh, a WAF to be in a cloud native environment. And so we built, we, we built our WAF to be more 
cloud native. It integrates with a lot of different cloud native scenarios. And uh, you'll see that in, in the slides coming forward. And more so than anything else, cloud native and its close nature is to be very DevOps, um, DevOps worthy. And so we've done that as well. A lot of the configuration is declarative. You will see that in the upcoming demos as well. But we complement that with the ability to have a UI to configure it anyway. And this entire project is still community. Uh, the prime capability of the ML-based path is completely community. It's free. And, um, and we, on top of that, put our additional services, um, like feeding in telemetry reputation of um, reputation of uh, IP addresses, domains. There, I, there, we do have an inbuilt IPS as well. So updating the IPS with signatures to detect and respond to known attacks. So these these are charged on top of that, but the community addition is uh, it holds the core of what Open AppSec is. And like I said, it's quite cloud native. So which means this is a, this is this is a WAF that can get deployed onto a Kubernetes cluster as an ingress controller. Uh, it can be deployed on on Docker as a uh, as a tiny plugin on top of it. You could have it on place of Kong as a plugin as well. It has wildly different kind of uh, deployments, reminiscing that cloud native uh, form factor that I spoke of before. And uh, the the detections that I was speaking of before, it has caught a lot of different things in the wild. So you see that um, we predicted and prevented log4j, but uh, again, log4shell and text4shell and three, four other uh, discoveries. And we also had a shout out from a, uh, a, a peer within within the industry, Clarity, Clarity, Clarity's research team, Team 82. They did a, a meta research on a specific bypass technique, the JSON bypass technique on pretty much every WAF vendor out there, all the big names you can hear of. And they all were susceptible to the bypass except us. Now, we're winding up to the more technical part of it. But uh, to just give you a quick glimpse before we get on to that, I mentioned that we are a ML-based buyer. And so I'll give you a glimpse before we get there. It's, it's, a, it's a very abused word, saying that a pro security product is ML-based, especially today. So we uh, kind of want to put ours up front. And so we have about 11 machine learning models that, that, uh, that, that work within the uh, WAF itself. And here are the six that, uh, here are the five, sorry, that really matter. Uh, we, we have models that, that track and learn user behavior, models that track and learn cloud behavior. There are models that um, identify patterns and in ongoing transactions, there are a handful of these. So in the examples coming forward, I will give you how I will give you a, a drill down of how each one of these core modules, ML models, will uh, work individually. Now, talking about the problem of why signature based. So right now, I set a premise of why uh, of, of of where we came in with the ML-based path. But to be more specific about it, the core problem of uh, a, I would say, signature-based WAF is that it's uh, it, it can't keep up with the pace that we have, uh, we have today. The time between a vulnerability being discovered and exploit being developed for it and exploit being widely packaged and sold for it, and then the time between that and then uh, a mature prevention practice coming about is is pretty uh, pretty wide. The time gap is pretty wide, and so that's the issue that we are trying to address here. And now, how it works? Right? How does our ML-based WAF, our contextual ML-based WAF, work? So. To simplify it as much as possible, before we get into the weeds of it, there are two phases that we operate in. 
remember there are no signatures anywhere here there are two phases first phase is what we call uh, a this is more like a filter it's like a basic filter phase where we detect indicators indicators of positively good behavior and i'm doubling down over there i'm seeing positively good or indicators of um, suspicious suspicious intent this could be suspicious because it's uh, out of out of character this could be suspicious because it has certain traits in the request um, but then you have the first line of um, filtering and this, this happens quite quickly and then you get to decide whether and you know the request is forwarded to the relevant workload or it goes on to the second line of analysis which is the uh, the more the advanced uh, the the ml engines the roster of ml engines that i spoke of before so those engines would be consulted to get a verdict on whether to allow it or not so these are the two phases and like i said these are the roster of ml engines that would be consulted to to decide whether to allow it past phase two or not, user behavior, crowd behavior, and such. We look at specific examples. The specific example for not uh, just for phase one, just for stage one. These are the indicators that we look for. So conventional VAPs would would have much more wider signature based definitions, right? If you're looking at an SQL injection, it's going to be much wider. It's going to be much defined. We don't look for the whole pattern of an SQL injection. We're looking for indicators as we use that word differently. Here, an indicator for us is just, um, you know, a, a quotation, single quotation or double quotation. It's not the entire string that might that might be an SQL injection. This this being a very simple or sometimes even a generic signature, we look for specific indicators, and each indicator has a weight. You're looking, and you're looking at an example of that on the right. And if this, if we see enough number of indicators in the first phase, the, in the first stage, we kind of flag it off as being suspicious. And this is this is phase one, so it's pretty easy for us to understand this. If a request is legitimate, we flag it off at phase one. Uh, I mean, we, we we send it forward. If it if it's not, it's flagged off at phase one. It's a very hard gate to bypass. And then comes the second phase, assuming that the request was flagged and sent for the second phase or stage of analysis, then you have the individual ML engines kicking in. So each engine would work. Over time, it has its own maturity curve, and each in each ML engine, the user reputation engine, the payload score engine, uh, the URL reputation engine, all of these models would assign its own score. It would assign its own score, and a cumulative of that score would then be uh, consulted to decide whether this request is sent forward or not. This is how it works, the two stages. First stage being basic filtering, and second stage is where the actual ML models are consulted uh, for a decision. Now, this is a very brief example of, uh, it's a snapshot of uh, how these scores are built. I'm not going to dwindle deep further and have more I uh, have better examples down the line, but very simply put, this is how it looks like. When you actually pull the learnings from the ground, this is how it looks like. There is a score assigned for each request and for each parameter in that request, and then they uh, then they accumulate down the line. This will make now. Now you saw how it works. You saw how the model works. Now let's take a Quick reflection of how this looks like when you actually put an exploit through it. Log4j, the most, most, most popular one is the most known one. A lot of you will know how a Log4j attack looks like. So it'll be very interesting to, sh to show you snapshot by snapshot how we are able to address it. So assume we, I'll be showing you the example of the first one, second and third, not for now, but just the first one. So remember stage one, we're looking for straightforward indicators. We're looking for simple, very atomic indicators and their presence. So when you see 
the log for shell request coming in. And this is assuming that RWAP has no idea of what a log for shell attack is. There is no pre-built definition for it. The model as well is not adjusted to, to know it, right? So this is quite literally a zero day example that we are hypothesizing here. When the request comes in, you see that we are able to uh, capture just the first two characters and say these individually have their own spores. These are individual indicators. It's quite suspicious that they're present in the request. They have their own spores. And the fact that their scores there are present kind of cumulate up. And rather than allowing it to be pushed, sends it to the second phase. This is what happened actually when we try to uh, land a log for log for J exploit. Now, in the second phase, three or four of the different engines were kind of consulted, right? The most dynamic engine of all, based on situation and based on time, is the user reputation engine. So this is by far one of the more important ones, where um, you know an attacker to be able to bypass this particular engine has to build up good reputation, or has to at the very very least steal credentials that has good reputation, and then use it exactly like those credentials would have been used. And likewise, the other 11 engines, all of them, look at these requests and put their score in. And cumulatively, we saw that uh, the URL score was just breaking it, right? It, it was, this, this particular URL was compared with uh, all the other URLs that were requested for this particular resource. And this was completely, um, it, was, it, was like, it was standing out like a sore thumb. All the other URLs were more about uh, inputting inputting data. This one was quite strange because it had unknown characters. So the pattern really did assign a higher score to it. And then the individual parameters as well that was part of the body, that as well was assessed and we got a high score. So this is this is how we uniquely dealt with the log4shell, the log4j, uh, log4shell exploit through log4j. Zero day. And we were able to block it. So there are blogs about how we did this. We have third-party accolades as well of how this, uh, of, of how they tested us against this without any signatures put in, and we 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 did block it live. And this is in essence how the model works. And when I show you the demo, you'll realize it more. There are no avenues for you to write signatures. It's all just machine learning models. And even when you're configuring the WAF, you. Uh, you literally will, will be teaching it how to write rules. You would be performing supervised learning or you would just let it uh, go through hours and hours of unsupervised learning. And just you, you just need to nudge the learning here and there a bit by fine-tuning uh, fine its suggestions or by performing supervised learning. But you don't write rules. You just help the WAF write better rules. This is what you do. We'll see that. We'll have a glimpse of that in the demo. <laughs> Excuse me. And about the management options. Now, this is a community tool. So we've, uh, we've devised two different management options. Firstly, for those of you who are more um, adept with coding, uh, with, with code, with anything as code, so we are able to uh, pass down this particular uh, product's configurations as code as well. So you, you can use it as CRDs within uh, Kubernetes cluster. We have we have the we have the stencils of those published. So you can just configure the CRD and you can use it in the pipeline as well, which is very interesting. As you are building an application and as you're about to publish um, publish an application and you're about to deploy deploy a manifest onto a Kubernetes cluster, you can have this ready as well. And you can configure the deployment right at the time um, the your, your app deployment is going through. Or we have, for, for, for the pure security folks among us, we have a dashboard. I like the dashboard, really, uh, because it's, it's more from a continuous perspective, an ongoing perspective. I can look at the dashboard, I can configure it, I can troubleshoot it. I can analyze attacks. And the learning curve is not as steep as that from coding a whole document. These are the two options that we have for managing it. Sorry, 
Do you mind if I just yeah. ask a quick question? Uh, we've got oh, a question in the audience who's asking, how, how do you decide on the threshold scores for the risk levels? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, how do you decide on the? Uh, on the threshold, threshold scores, yes, right. for risk levels. Okay, the threshold scores for risk levels. You're, so I'm assuming you're asking me, how do we decide what is a seven? What is seven on on a scale of ten? Right. You're, I think this is the question that's being put forth. So it's it's just plain old security research. We have teams. We have security folks, uh, just purebred security researchers who um, who just analyze and mull and debate on how these scores are, uh, are are defined and then just then the, that goes into the algorithm so you as the consumer you still do have the ability to uh, bias these scores in certain ways but uh, the, the thick of it is if something if, if for example i saw a certain indicator here it bumps up to a seven uh, it is it is predefined i hope that answers your question I'm just waiting for some feedback on that. Yeah, we're all good. Thank you very much, Gaj, and thank you, Sai. If anybody else has got any other questions, please pop, pop them into the question section. Thanks, Sai. Yep, my apologies. So uh, I I will pause right. I will I will uh, pause for any questions right here, particularly in the management models. We have two options, right? We do have the ability to self-declare just in files. There is no management locally managed, and then you have the SaaS dashboard which, um, yes, it's still part of the community solution. You pay nothing. SaaS dashboard is posted by us for free. And you get to use it for free. It's part of the community edition. And then there is a hybrid deployment where you can define define the configuration locally. It reflects onto the SaaS dashboard. Um, but those are the two, those are the two popular alternatives your ability to define your policy locally, just like anything anything else on, co on a Kubernetes cluster, we allow you to use custom resource definitions, and then the SaaS dashboard. Any questions here before we jump on to uh, the quick demo? I will walk you through the platform, and then we'll, then we'll yeah, actually we'll look at the live deployment. We've got a couple of questions that come on through. One from um, Arun, mm -hmm. who's asking: Are these are these scores dynamic or configurable? They are yeah. dynamic because because we imagine that the scores are not completely defined by us. The rules of the game, the rules of how the ML models work, are defined by our security analysts. But the ML model themselves build their own uh, perceptions. So you will see this. Um, you, you, OK, so the ML models build their own perceptions. And so the score that you get is pretty dynamic. I might get a user reputation. So we, we might both, as two separate organizations, we might both be hit by um, you know, a lock for shell exploit, for example, while having open AppSec. Your score would be different compared to mine, because your score is in context to you as an organization. And the kind of users you've been uh, receiving, the amount of crowd, the size of the crowd you, the crowd traffic you received that day, uh, the nature of the application that you built. So it's very bespoke to you. Right? If it's a 7.2, there's a good chance if you receive 7.2 for a certain kind of uh, exploit as a cumulative score, there's a good chance that nobody else will see the same exact score. They'll see something in that region but they won't get the same exact score because their variables that document their environment are different. The, let me just jump back here. Uh, no, not this. Yep, uh, also, let me see. All right. No, let's just go back to the previous one. So their variables are wildly different. Right? I'm just showing four examples over here. But uh, for example, we could be two different organizations and the user reputation of the request that I received and the one that you received would be wildly different. We have different users. The attack would have happened at different times to different workloads. That's going to be different. Payload score depends on the nature of the application that the hacker is trying to exploit. So you will see reminiscence of that as well in the payload that's being sent out. 
although this code is heavily influenced by those few telltale signs so this code will fairly be similar uh, but not the same and then the url score will be again wildly different because this this is the score of this url in comparison to uh, the typical kind of url request that particular workload will request so for me in my environment this is wildly different so i got a 7.2 in your environment, it might be even more drastically different. You might receive a higher score than that. It is custom to your environment. That's the short of it. I hope I answered your question. Awesome. And, and the other question? Yes, Aruna said, yes, that did answer the question. So Rashita is asking, does, oh, does OpenSec have detection only approach? Uh, as there might be some That's URL a good question. You can move to prevention. May so, look like an attack. Yes, there you see the block here. Yeah, you can move to prevention. So the machine learning machine learning models will kind of um, advise you in a very simplistic manner. It will tell you where its uh, maturity is from a learning perspective. And so once it goes to a very a fairly reasonable stage when the machine learning models cumulatively say we've all learned enough you can confidently put it in prevention cool i hope that answered your question <clears throat> okay we've got another uh what one we've got quite a lot of questions anything else before we get to the demo <laughs> i've just got one one more question if that's okay uh, so we've got, does, does OpenSec have detection-only approach? All right. Hang on a second. That's the same thing. Uh, we've got somebody else here. Mohammed is asking if they can have the link for the YAML file for the kind policy resource. Is that possible to make that available? Everybody's screen seems to have blank here. Hmm. Oh, that's Sai coming back. All right. Uh, when did you lose me? When did you guys lose me? I hope not for too long. Just five seconds ago for me. Even can you hear me? Yep. Yep, it's all good. Yeah, it looks like I dropped for a bit. Only about five seconds. All right. So that's, that's fine. Let me just quickly. I'll save the, the, the rest of the questions until after the demo. <laughs> All right. So let me just quickly share my screen here. All right. There you go. Here it comes. All right. So this is the dashboard right here. I do have a few sample deployments, although not much data is present. We'll do a live one. So this is a definition of an app that was already present. Now, you will see different rules and sections over here. You zoom out a bit. All right, so you do have a basic uh, policy definition that you can put in place saying that I want these modules to be enabled. So you have the uh, the API, API secure, you have the web application and API protection module. So this is the one that sticks with the community. It, it addresses a roster of different attacks, both unique and general. On top of it, particular to API security, you do have schema validation that can be done. And on top of that, now we are going into the what's premium in the product. You do have the IPS module, which got ported off from our AVID security practice and our file security practice. 
so i'm able to scan files for reputation and i'm able to scan scan the traffic for patterns of known attacks and these are attacks that are more uh, pertinent to let's say exploiting uh, vulnerabilities that are part of apache for example these are known vulnerabilities we typically don't expect a waf to deal with this but we have an ips module that does that anyway so it it overrides the requirement of having a point waf in line now what's what's uh, let me just give you one screenshot here i don't think i have the right data let me just bring that up one moment please All right, so I just want to show you one screenshot where I have data populated. And this would give you a very good perspective of how the learning models work. All right, do let me know when you're able to see it. Also, I might need to zoom if the text is not crisp enough. All right, so. So this is the same learning tab that you saw there. Uh, I just happened to take it uh, in a more mature dashboard. So what you will see here is it. This is quite literally a section where you are interacting with the models, the ML models of your of your WAF. Now you see a large amount. It, this is you receiving some feedback. The WAF is telling you, you know, I've processed about eight million. 8 million benign requests, about 300,000 malicious requests. I need your advice for 179 of those. I have seen 118,000 unique sources. So it's 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 the WAF telling you how the learning is going. And now here, here it is being a bit more evident on how the learning is going. Right? It has a very, um, I would say, on the nose mnemonic for you to understand how the learning is going. So it's right now telling me that it's at graduate level. It starts at kindergarten and then you have preschool and then you have high school and then you graduate, and then you do post-graduation, then you get PhD. So it's, uh, it has a very simple analogy for you to understand where the learning is. Uh, and it, it's telling, now right now on this screenshot, it's telling me I need to process about 6 million more requests and receive two more trusted sources to be able to graduate to PhD, which is pretty uh, pretty cool. You know, like I said before, you don't write rules, you're teaching the WAF how to write rules, you're teaching the WAF how to uh, make enforcements. And when you scroll down here, you're seeing sections over here where the WAF is now asking me, you know, these are the critical definitions I've had, critical discoveries I've had. I need your opinion on this. What do you think? Is it malicious? Is it benign? So this is quite literally the WAF consulting you on what to do with these discoveries. And you can give a feedback on, on yeah, it's malicious. Yeah, it's benign. And when you make these decisions, it does affect the models again. And another very um, direct way of you affecting the model is, defining yourself as a trusted user so i can for example if i had a a user id on a mobile app that is using a lot of uh, that is consuming a lot of api endpoints through an api gateway on which on open appsec is present i can define my user id my name my unique user identification as a trusted user and so whenever I send out requests, I can quite literally define that and then I can take my phone out and I can perform a, a list of normal behavior, a list of what is defined as good behavior. And 
open app set will look at me through my phone through my uh, client and it will say this is what a good user is so you're not writing the rules of what a good user is you're just being a good user and the app looks at you and it learns that's that's a very interesting way of fine tuning your app but yes back to the demo so you do have a section for defining custom rules though and the purpose of this section right here is for you to just maybe override make quick exceptions but the second part of the tab it's called exceptions is is for you to kind of get that um message you're not using it um all the time you're using it exceptionally you write rules exceptionally so i will run you through a very quick demo um and before before i do this or rather i'll, I'll give you the uh, the playground information as well later so um we will we, we'll drop it in chat but i will just walk you through the demo again now i will i'll show you how quickly a deployment can be done now what i have right here is a i have a a kubernetes cluster with uh, with a handful of workloads on it particular one that i'm concerned of is is uh, this one acme audit and what i also have is an ingress controller uh, an nginx ingress controller now i will latch on to this nginx ingress controller uh, with with this deployment it's very easy you just have to get the installer in and then run the installer and right now it's being configured in local local management mode with declarative policies i'll give you a quick perspective of that so i will i will duplicate it this is simpler and i'm going to protect only the web app for now this is the one ingress definition that i have and there you go it's it's installed it's done and now it's allowing me to write and modify rules so i'm not going to write and modify rules i'll give you a perspective of how those rules look like though let's save it as manifests and then let it run and now while it's running in the background all of these rules are uh, unless you connect it to the management portal here unless you connect it to this portal which we'll do in the second half of the demo all of these rules are declarative like kubernetes yamls like this so this is the yaml for a policy i have it predefined this is the yaml for a response for a log so from a developer point of view i don't have to go to another dashboard if i'm writing an application you can just give them these skeleton templates of what they need to fill up they already do this anyway um most companies do just a lot of developers to fill up skeleton kubernetes manifest or helm charts and you can do this as an extension and they can just pump it through their application as part of the pipeline it's very um, pro developer that way and right now it's deployed so let me just pull this away right and uh, so this is one policy that got created here and you're seeing that the policy that i that that it got generated through the nice gui tool that i have the the nice uh, interactive cli tool that i had so now it's deployed deployed in just two two steps of the command is deployed in uh, i would say prevention mode is deployed in prevention mode there you go prevent learn is deployed in prevent mode for just specific attacks for a specific workload 
the learning is yet to kick in that takes time. So let's check the scenario where I try to exploit the attack. All right, now that the payload is in, let's try to launch a simplistic exploit on the Acme audit. So what I would do is I will, very simple, I will try to put up an SQL injection in the user segment. And of course it's dropped, it's blocked. But let's then take a look at the the local declaration, uh, the local logs to identify the attack. And you are seeing it right here. Right, threat prevention of application API protection. Right, playground to it was prevented. Now, this is with the CLI, and it's, it's nice and convenient if you are a developer. But uh, let's try to look at a scenario where I connect this to the GUI. And for the security folks among us, is something that's more digestible. So I have the GUI already with me. And I will try to connect this to the GUI right now. All right, so I'll go to profiles and I will and here I have two options here. By the way, we support Kong as well. Kong as an ingress controller or Nginx as an ingress controller. Kong is more pertinent when you're uh, securing just API workloads. So I will connect my local uh, local deployment, which is now completely disconnected. It's still here, it's purely local. It's completely disconnected. I will, uh, so let me just. So you are seeing it um, right here. purely local this one and then this one is the actual module that is preventing it as the ingress controller and this is the module on top of the ingress controller is the app sec open app sec module on top of the ingress controller is actually preventing it this is completely disconnected now where i will um, define the policies locally as you saw let me just show you all the policy documents very quickly So you're seeing these, right? There is local, there are local policies that I can edit directly for uh, editing the policies, for editing the lock triggers, for editing all of these things. Now this is difficult for some uh, runtime environments for, for large scalable runtime, for a large scalable runtime practice. So that's where you want to connect to the dashboard. So let's do that now. Same as before, just have a package downloaded and run the package with the token that represents this environment. Steven, you'll have to give me a heads up if I'm uh, within the five minute mark. And right now you're seeing that it's uh, whatever definitions that I did locally, all of these definitions that I did before locally are being pushed onto the cloud. It's being replicated onto this particular management server right here. 
so that I can start managing it from there. And you see that there is one agent deployed here, present in the dashboard. And there you go. This was the old one, and here's the new one. And that's about it. So it's as simple as that. Now I can make the configuration changes from here. I can write policies from here. I can customize it from here. And uh, it should reflect locally. So let's go over uh, that attack again. And now let's analyze the logs in the dashboard. Same thing. I come to the uh, the Acme the Acme Auto Tap. Same place. I put in the SQL injection string. But now the logs are not local. They are sent to the management server. So I can come to monitoring here. I can go to important events. I will see that there is an SQL injection right here. SQL injection that was prevented. There is so now you will see a lot more information here. Let me just zoom in a bit, or rather, let me open it up. All right, so you'll see a lot more information on uh, how the decision came about. Yeah, look at this. The identified, the match sample was this. It was matched in this parameter. These are the indicators. These are the indicators that was flagged. You have a, you have a single, so it doesn't care for the entire string. Remember, it doesn't care for the entire string at all. It cares for the fact that there were enough indicators uh, individually present for it to, you know, uh, get a high score. And then, Combine that with user reputation is low. I'm just doing this for the first time. So clearly I have to build a reputation over time. My reputation is low. With those two factors in mind, this is flagged as a critical event. I can go back to the assets tab. And I can go to learnings. And you can see that there's already the learning has kicked off. So the more and more requests I, I receive, the more and more requests the AppSec receives, the faster it will learn, the more accurate its predictions will be. Any questions here? I think we're pretty much at the end of the demo. I will wind up by uh, talking, just, just having the takeaways in. And very quickly before this, um the core of whatever i showed right now everything that i demoed right now is part of the community edition so you can use it immediately out of the box dashboard and all included it's free and perpetual you can use it out of the box uh only certain features are gate walled for you know from the premium and all, uh, upward up to enterprise so this is more in the likes of advanced features Let's say you want to enable intrusion prevention, the IPS module, you want to enable anti-bot module, the file security module. These are all modules that require a lot of constant telemetry from Checkpoint. You need to build the infrastructure for that and feed the knowledge to it. And so we charge for that. And that's what is behind the premium edition. And then enterprises, of course, enterprises. It's that, but with, with, with a different agreement all, altogether about it. I would say test your uh, test your environments with the community edition. It is the MLWAF uh, and the API security modules with the dashboard built in. And that will be it. I'm going to agree with Karthik that you must have been praying to the demo gods. Everything went very, very smoothly there. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I interrupted. 
No, 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 sweater, sweater. I mean, I was I was pretty anxious about the demo as well, but uh, <laughs> it's it's a pretty it's a pretty nifty solution. It works pretty fast and you. I mean, and this entire demo environment is open for anybody. So, I'll I'll be able to put the link on chat. Anybody can log into the playground and mess around with the environment. I'm sure that that'd be extremely helpful for some people on the call today. I will, well, right at the end of the call while we're answering the questions. Uh, but to quickly, and my apologies, uh, just just a minute or so, just to quickly put down the takeaways, and then we can. I hope that's fine. Uh, just, we've got yes. we've got a few questions. If you're up for some. All right. Yeah, I can. We can move to the questions. Yes. Yes. Uh, so. <clears throat> I got one here that says, "I see agents deployed in the cluster connect back to the web GUI central management uh, dashboard. So, if you have a bunch of apps deployed in a fleet of clusters, would you need to individually set up Open App Sec, or how do large scale setups? What do they look like?" So, you would need to individually set up um, App Sec for each Kubernetes cluster. The idea being that it is a cloud native WAF, so it has to sit inside the cluster for it to get all the context uh, of of that particular cluster. So right now I'm showing you north south, right? I'm sitting outside and I'm sending the request to a service that's exposed by the ingress. But what about east west? If there is a pod within the Kubernetes cluster that's reaching out to a service, you can secure those as well. That's the benefit of being cloud native and part of the cluster. A downside, and I wouldn't call it downside, is the is the responsibility you bear is to make sure that you have it deployed individually on each cluster. Yep. Okay. Um, <clears throat> got another question from Karthik here uh, regarding the Open AppSec WAF blocking the Clarity Team eighty two attack. Was it a particular ML model of the eleven mm -hmm. models, I believe, that triggered it as an attack? So um, we've just heard anecdotes of how it actually worked because uh, to be very frank about it, Clarity never allowed us to access the WAF they, they used. They, they, they just used our instance and they tested it and they said it blocked their, uh, the JSON requests. Now we never had the opportunity to jump in and just freeze frame the model and kind of analyze why it did it. We speculate that it is uh, it's a mixture of uh, URL reputation uh, because remember you're you're sending out JSON uh, you're sending out parameters in JSON format which is quite strange uh, it's, it's it's a mix of URL request and user reputation with uh, with board with with uh, parameter reputation as well I think I think that's that's what happened. So we've got another one here that's saying, uh, can, can we collect logs from Open AppSec and push them to Open Search? You can. You absolutely can. It's stored as JSON. Stored as JSON on a file. Just push it to wherever you want to push it to. It works. Another one here saying, are the policies open sourced or community driven? I.e., end users can share their policies or shared across your customer base? So the policies themselves, by policy, I imagine you're talking about um, the rules, the rules that you write. Those, those would be unique to your environment. So there is no, there is no drive for, for you to have it, uh, you know, community. The entire project, by the way, is, is on GitHub though. So everything from the source code down to uh, why the ML, how the ML models, uh, how the rules for the ML models are set up, are all open source. So that's fair game. You can change that as much as you want to uh, in your own fork. Right. I'm just trying to cherry pick a few here. We've got a bunch of yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, let me just see if there's one more. 
Okay, so what, this is one from, uh, from Shane. Uh, sorry that he might have missed this. He's coming just a little, little bit late, maybe. But what defines a user? Is it an IP or a set of attributes? For example, a user having a bad reputation one day, you know, running an infected machine versus another week where the machine is clean now? That's a very good question. So we have a couple of ways to identify a unique user. Uh, the most simplistic way is using an IP address, but that really that rarely works cleanly. Uh, we can also look for other indicators, virtually anything. So you could you could program this in into uh, into what defines a user, unique user, any parameter in the HTTP header. And what we prominently, popularly decide on is using Jot, uh, the unique token that represents the user. So once you once you're able to uh, decode the token, there is some every application has a way to uniquely identify a user within within the job. So we use that as a popular approach. What about, I mean, what what sort of environments uh, can this be deployed across? Is it just like a sort of pu public cloud only, or can you do private cloud, or a bit of a hybrid perhaps? Or You could deploy it uh, in any environment that's considered cloud native. If this could be on-premise as well, or this could be in the cloud. This could be in the public cloud space as well. The idea is uh, this is a cloud native app meant to secure cloud native workloads. So if you have an on-premise Kubernetes cluster and you have exposed hundreds of services and you have a fat WAF on the perimeter trying to secure it, yeah, that's a that's a game you're setting setting up for yourself where you're going to lose. So those environments is where we would want to be in. Cloud native. Think cloud native. If you, should, you should think for a app like this, or for example, an API gateway. You people are, have Kong as a very popular practice for API gateways. We sit on top of Kong, and we're able to secure the API requests going into Kong. So those so one, scenarios. One last question here. So obviously, the WAF is going to be really good at, at protecting the the, the, the web facing stuff. I don't suppose that there's any little magical plugin that can help to also protect the underlying infrastructure as well, all the, you know, the VMs or the containers, is there? The underlying infrastructure, you, so um, this particular product is part of a, uh, a grander agent, which can be deployed for securing workloads. So this, the same agent can, can, can secure workloads. It's definitely possible, but that's part of the enterprise uh, package. It's not part of the, the community edition or the premium edition. I'm sure that Nigel's just going to flick a switch and all the, all these features <laughs> will be available in the community, right, Nigel? That's right. <laughs> um, just in the in the couple of minutes that we've got left, uh, side, you just want to run through the takeaways? So, um, very very quickly guys the takeaway is that the only thing that that, uh, that i want you to remember just one thing i want you to remember is that why i've sucked today because it's static and you need to really let machine uh, machine learning models work for you right we're talking about generative ais you need to really have your WAF, uh you know write its own rules so that's that's the one thing that you really need to remember um if you plan to remember one more thing Cloud native, anything cloud native, you need a unique approach. You don't need perimeter apps. You don't need apps on load balancers. None of those work because you're you won't you won't be securing uh, the cloud native workloads with the context of being cloud native. Those are the only two takeaways. There are quite a few on the screen, but I'll just stick with two. And I wanted to drop a, drop the lab. Uh, info in the chat so that folks can possibly just keep it um, keep it with themselves while there's also just I'm um, interested in the how, how, how do people get involved in the mm -hmm. community version of the sponsor uh, of the software I should say 
uh, and also if people are interested from like an enterprise or commercial perspective, I'm assuming that they should reach out to yourself, Nigel? Yep, that's fine. And you are Nigel, Nigel S? Nigel S at checkpoint.com. There we go. I think I've got it here. I'll just pop it up in the chat. 